Went away to college and played football, which at my size was a stretch. I was about five, seven, 140 pounds. So that's very small American football. And the reason I could survive was I just would let this angry part totally take over. And so it was useful on the football field, but it wasn't so useful in relationships. And as a leader, which I later became, between the angry part and then to counter the feeling of worthlessness that I'd gotten from my father, I had a, a part that really wanted to prove him wrong and to, to do something important. And then of course I had parts that never thought I could ever do anything. We call it the brain, but in fact, it is an organ made up of lots of different structures, each with its own function that communicate with each other via neural networks. So the miracle is that we're as integrated and whole as we are, given that every minute we're receiving information from different parts of the brain, and miraculously it comes together. We know from brain scan research that it's the right brain that responds to traumatic activation, and the left brain is kind of out of it, which is why often people don't remember what happened. They're very confused about what happened because the left brain is the side of the brain that would tell us, okay, this is how it happened. Here's the chronology. This is why, here's how it started. But the left brain is just not involved because the survival brain, the right brain, is what gets us through. Because for most people around the world, trauma doesn't come as a single incident. It's an environment. You know, war is a traumatic environment. Child abuse, same thing, right? It's a dangerous environment. Domestic violence, the same thing. With these chronic traumatic environmental conditions, the left and right brains begin to operate more separately. So we have to work with people as divided beings. The message is that so many of our problems are because we tend to try to demonize and lock up each other instead of listening at first and then actually helping each other heal. So that writ large creates the kinds of governments and cultures that we are faced with now. And between that kind of approach and then trauma was talking about with myself, but people in general, those traumas produce extreme parts, protectors that can dehumanize other people and get very, very driven and selfish and blinded to the damage that they can do. And any time somebody gets near one of those vulnerable parts, the fight and flight parts put up a massive defense. So you see that a lot with perpetrators of domestic violence who get paranoid that their spouses are having an affair, which is a fear of the cry for help part. And then their fight parts respond to the fear of this cry for help part by becoming violent, controlling, and angry. Some of this is a message of love, not war. You know, I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, and some of it is a message of we have to heal the traumas. We have to go to where we're stuck in the past. A young woman who, at age 13, I think most of the worst of her abuse was over. but. She was in such a bad state that she was put in a psychiatric hospital with adults, which was a terrifying experience. And when she came out of hospital, she went to a party with her friends and someone gave her a beer. And she remembered taking two or three sips of beer and suddenly feeling this wave of relief. And she said to herself, okay, if I have beer, I can make it through 
until I get out of my family. So she used beer to get through secondary school. She used even more beer to get through university. And when I met her, she was a full-blown alcoholic. But she'd gotten herself to safety. She'd gotten away from her family. She'd gotten a good education. She had a good job. But that automatic use of substances to soothe every triggered emotion, at that point, it was an addiction, so she couldn't stop. I read a statistic recently that said 60% of the population lives paycheck to paycheck. And so there's lots and lots of pain and people in constant states of insecurity. And with that comes very extreme protectors. And it's all parallel. How you relate to or think about these different parts of you will translate into how you see and act toward people who resemble those parts. The cry for help part is the part of individuals that is desperate, vulnerable, emotional, and wants family members and friends and therapists to save her. The submit part usually appears as someone who's depressed, who's struggling with shame, hopelessness, passivity, and inability to say no. Often the submit parts are caretakers for everyone in their worlds except themselves. The fear or freeze parts present with all kinds of anxiety from panic attacks to particular phobias, social phobia, fear of being around other people. And then the fight part obviously is the angry part. The flight part is the addict part. So think of flight as about getting away. So eating disorders, addictions, all help to take us away. They change our emotional states. And also, of course, the flight part is the part that runs away, that has trouble with commitment. Most people have heard the phrase inner child. And when I was discovering all of this, I would be working with people who would identify their parts. And, and it was clear that some of their parts they had locked up inside in inner basements or jails. And then others were managing their life and trying to protect them from those parts they'd locked up. That was the big distinction that leaped out immediately. The parts that had been locked away and then the parts that kind of guarded them or kept them locked up. It seemed that the ones who had been locked up carried these intense burdens of emotional pain or terror or shame or sense of abandonment or rejection or things like that. And as I got to know them better, what I learned was these parts weren't always like that, that before they picked up these burdens from traumas, they were these playful, lively, creative, fun-loving inner children who also are the most sensitive parts of us because they're young and innocent. And, and so they're the ones that get hurt the most by what happens to us, these negative experiences. And they take on these extreme beliefs and emotions that I call burdens. And so this happy, playful child got felt rejected by somebody and now feels worthless, now has the ability to take over and make you feel that and make you believe that you're worthless. It's hard to navigate life feeling like you're worthless. And so other parts sort of naturally try to lock it up. Parts of you that get hurt the most or scared the most or feel the most shame just so you can make it. And then you have a lot of exiles. And once you have a lot of these exiles, you feel a lot more delicate and the world seems a lot more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And if they get triggered, they burst out of wherever you've got them and they can overwhelm you. And then it's hard to function and you have symptoms. And so other parts are forced out of their naturally valuable states into protective roles to try and keep the exiles contained and never trigger. And some of them, try to manage your life so that nothing bad happens and people like you and if you don't get rejected or criticized. They might keep you a certain distance from people so no one gets close enough to trigger you or make you look perfect or perform at a high level. All of those things, or they might try to take care of everybody so that everybody depends on you. Or So there's a lot of common, what we call manager roles. So these. That's one class of protector. 
the, the parts that are running your daily life. So we all have a bunch of those. They've got us this far. They deserve a lot of credit for that. Doesn't always work. Despite the manager's best efforts, we get triggered. Big explosion, flames of emotion are gonna consume us. Something has to happen to get us away from that. So there's another set of parts who immediately jump into action to either get us higher than those flames of emotion or douse them with substance or distract us until they burn themselves out. So we call those firefighters. They're fighting the flames of emotion. And most of us have a kind of hierarchy of those parts. And if the first one doesn't work, we go to the next one and so on and so on. Those parts, in contrast to the managers that are trying to keep you in control and please everybody, those parts will take you out of control. They don't care about the collateral damage to your body or your relationships. They just got to get you away from those feelings right now, whatever it takes. Often what I say that really gets people's attention is I say, remember, all the addict part is doing is putting whiskey in the baby bottle to sedate all your little wounded parts. And then people go, well, I would never put whiskey in a baby bottle. <laughs> and I say, yes, but your addict part does on a regular basis. How do you think they feel? Do you think they feel safer or less safe? And, you know, most addicts say, well, I guess they feel less safe. Yeah. And if they feel less safe, guess what? Your addict part has to put more whiskey in the baby bottle to get them to shut up. When we feel that we failed, when we feel shame, it's a very unpleasant emotional state. And, and for people with addictions, Uncomfortable emotional states mean have another drink. You need a few more pills. Shame doesn't help any of us. Maybe we think that when someone's ashamed, they're taking responsibility, but they're not because responsibility is higher level thinking. That's something that's easier to do if you've been curious. Yeah, if we're curious, it's easier to take that responsibility. When we feel shame, I don't want to take responsibility. So I always get people to first look at how is this substance helping you? Because usually when they start to be curious about how the substance is helping them, they pretty quickly realize, well, it's kind of sort of helping, but it's actually not. You can't just go to a part and say, stop doing it. Stop, you know, making him drink all the time. You have to learn about how it's trying to protect other parts or is polarized with some other critic in there and start to work all of that. In learning all that, what came to me at some point was, yeah, there are no bad parts. They're all valuable inner beings with these wonderful qualities to help us in our lives. And when we don't suffer traumas or attachment injuries and so on, they just help us all our life. They give us advice or they give us joy or they all kinds of things but they're forced out of their naturally valuable states by trauma and attachment injury and they take on these extreme beliefs and emotions i call burdens and they get frozen in the past they get frozen in time uh, and they think you're still five years old and they have to protect you in the way they did back then as i'm trying to have these two parts talk maybe a third one is interfering and making one angry so I began asking clients to see if they could find the one who's interfering. And to my amazement, they would say, okay, yeah, I got it to move. And when they did, it was almost like this other person would pop up and would be curious in a pure way and calm and would have confidence and even compassion often for the target part. And when I would do the same process with other clients, it was like the same person would pop out spontaneously, simply by getting other parts that had been polarized to open space. If I were to ask you, okay, what part of you is that? It's likely you'd say some version of that's not a part like these others, that's me, that's myself. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And now 40 years later and thousands of clients later and thousands of people using this all over the world, we can safely say that that self is in everybody, can't be damaged, knows how to heal, and is just beneath the surface of these parts such that when they open space, it pops out spontaneously. So I had an argument with my wife this morning, 
and the part that she commonly triggers just totally took over and then I react to her from that place which of course only triggers her protectors more too and we've gotten very good at catching ourselves when we're when it's protector wars and one of us saying okay time out let's get a little space and I'll go and I'll get that protector to pull its energy out and I'll say okay look I know you've got this attitude about her but you know she's suffering right now with things she's worried about and so I can come back and apologize for letting that part take over and she can and we have more of a self to self connection and conversation so that's a lot of what we're shooting for it's not like when you've healed your parts you never have an argument but it's more like when you do you catch yourself and you get a little separation and you come back thank you for listening and i hope you enjoyed the show if you'd like to hear the full version you can do so with the weekend university premium membership this gets you access to our master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists professors and authors as well as transcripts cpd certification quizzes and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences for more information please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership